Hello and welcome to HIVRNA Test Guide Podcast, your trusted source for HIV testing, with over 4,500 plus testing labs across the United States. Welcome back to the deep dive. If you're looking for that shortcut to understanding cutting edge science uh, without drowning in medical journals, you are definitely in the right place. Today, we're doing a deep dive into something huge in medicine, the, well, the decades long search for a functional cure for HIV. And we're really zeroing in on a recent, um, very clever breakthrough from the Houston Methodist Research Institute. Yeah, our sources are suggesting this is maybe a real shift in thinking instead of just, you know, fighting the virus head on. This team asked this really radical question. What if we could actually make HIV trigger its own infected cells to self-destruct? It sounds kind of sci-fi, but it looks incredibly promising. It's really important to frame this right, though. Uh, thanks to amazing medicines, especially antiretroviral therapy, RT people with HIV now live long, healthy lives. Art's fantastic, truly. Yeah. But it isn't a cure. And the reason it only manages the virus, doesn't eliminate it, will come down to hiding places. The biggest hurdle, the absolute core problem for a cure, mm. is what we call HIV reservoirs. These are cells, usually CD4 immune cells, where the virus basically goes into deep sleep. Latency. And when it's latent, it's totally invisible to our current treatments. Ah, okay. So it's the ultimate game of hide and seek. The drugs only work if the virus is active, multiplying. If it's asleep, nothing. Exactly. And if someone stops taking their RDs, that sleeping virus inevitably wakes up from these reservoir cells and you get what's called viral rebound very quickly. So the whole mission of this Houston Methodist study, uh, doc Dr. Minley led it, published in the Journal of Infectious Diseases, was basically finding a way to get rid of those reservoirs. And the clever part is how? By turning the virus's own survival tricks against itself. Okay, let's unpack this then. That core problem in these reservoirs, why are they just so darn resilient? We know HIV infects these CD4 cells, goes quiet, becomes invisible. But you're saying the cells themselves also become harder to kill, even if the virus stirs a bit. Yeah, that's the crux of it. And that difficulty, um, it led to that earlier cure strategy people might have heard of, shock and kill. Right, shock and kill. The idea seemed pretty elegant, you know. Shock the virus awake, make it show itself, and then kill the cell before that newly awakened virus can spread around. Sounds logical. Almost simple. But uh, you're saying it didn't really pan out. For the most part, no. Not as hoped. Researchers could often shock the cells, wake the virus up, sure. But the kill part, it just wasn't very efficient. What we realized is that HIV is, well, it's incredibly sneaky. Once it gets inside that host cell, it actually rewires the cell's internal systems to make it really resistant to dying. It basically builds itself a fortified bunker. A fortified bunker inside our own immune cells. So the virus changes the cell's basic programming, its life cycle rules. What are the specific tricks it uses to get this like cellular immortality? Well, the sources point to two really key survival mechanisms that HIV hijacks. The first one is apoptosis. Apoptosis, that's programmed cell death, right? Exactly. It's the cell's built-in self-destruct button. Think of it like quality control. If a cell gets damaged or infected, the switch is supposed to flip, and the cell, well, politely dismantles itself for the greater good. And HIV somehow jams that switch, keeps it from flipping. It actively blocks the signaling pathways that trigger apoptosis. Yeah. It basically tells the cell, nope. Doesn't matter how messed up you are, you got to live. Mm. And the second trick involves a process called autophagy. Autophagy sounds like self-eating or recycling. That's a good way to put it, yeah. It's basically cell housekeeping. When a cell's under stress, it starts breaking down and recycling its own damaged parts to conserve energy and survive longer. HIV actually triggers this process. It uses the cell's own cleanup crew to help the cell hang on longer even when it's full of virus. Wow, okay, so the virus tells the cell, don't self-destruct and start recycling your junk to stay alive longer. These infected cells become, well, like you said, super tough. Exactly, super tough, which means any strategy trying to kill them has to fight against both the block self-destruct and this act of reinforcement going on. And that's the realization the Houston team had. That's the pivot point. That was the key insight. If HIV works so hard to make its host cell live, Maybe the answer was to engineer the cell to die instead. Flip the script. Okay, so the shift was, don't just focus on waking the virus to shock. Focus on disarming the cell's defenses first. Make it vulnerable again. Precisely. Their theory was, look, if we can strip away all that protection HIV built up, hmm. maybe even the tiny bit of stress and damage caused by the latent virus just trying to reactivate, maybe that would be enough to finally push the cell over the edge. 
They wanted to restore the cell's natural sensitivity to damage, you know. That is. That's really clever. It's like turning the virus's fortress walls into the trigger for its own demolition. Yeah. So how do they actually do that? Block the anti-death signals, block the autophagy. What specific molecules did they use? Right. So they put together this uh, pretty sophisticated combination therapy. They use specific selected molecules that target those exact pathways HIV needs to keep the cell alive. They had to do two things at once. Block the don't die signal from apoptosis and block the protective cleanup signal from autophagy. So once those survival pathways were jammed, then they reactivated the hidden HIV. That's the shock. But now the minimal damage from the virus waking up was suddenly lethal to the unprotected cell. The cell triggers apoptosis, destroys itself, and takes the virus down with it. The virus basically forces its own host into suicide. Here's where it gets really interesting, because they didn't just theorize this. They tested it in complex models, right? This wasn't just in a test tube. No, exactly. They tested two really crucial ways to see if it held up. First, in the lab, using human immune cells directly taken from people living with HIV. That's important. And second, they used humanized mice. These are mice specially engineered to have a human-like immune system. So you can see how the therapy works in a more complex living biological system. And this combination therapy wasn't simple. You said it was like a four-part cocktail to dismantle these defenses. Can you walk us through those components? Because they seem key to how selective this whole thing is. Yeah, it was a very targeted cocktail. Okay, yeah. first you need the shock parts. They use two different latency reversing agents, LRAs, to nudge that hidden virus awake. Yeah. Then came the two really crucial molecules designed to strip the cell's armor plating. The first was a drug called ABT-263. What this does is it significantly lowers the cell's resistance to death. It makes it much easier for apoptosis, that self-destruct sequence, to get triggered. It essentially unlocks the door HIV had bolted shut. Okay, ABT-263 unlocks the self-destruct door. What about stopping that reinforcement, the recycling? Ah, that was the job of the second molecule, so FIO-405. This compound specifically blocks autophagy. It stops the cell from doing that protective recycling and cleanup that HIV was exploiting. Got it. So block self-destruct resistance, block self-repair. Exactly. And then finally, they included standard RT drugs, specifically raltegravir and fostum stabar. But, and this is key, only temporarily. These were just a safety net, really, to make sure that any virus that did manage to wake up fully couldn't escape and start new infections while they were running the experiment. Okay, that makes sense. A highly controlled mechanism then. Shock the virus, unlock the death pathway, block the repair pathway, and add a temporary safety net. So hop in. The results, after all this complex engineering, they sound pretty dramatic. Tell us about the viral rebound numbers. Right, this is the payoff. After they gave the combination treatment, they stopped all drugs, including that art and safety net, and then they just watched the mice for eight weeks. They were looking to see if the virus would come roaring back from those hidden reservoirs. That's the gold standard test for a potential cure. Right. And in the control group, the mice that only got standard RT before stopping meds, what happened? Every single mouse, 100% had viral rebound, which is unfortunately exactly what you'd expect. Stopping ERT lets the reservoir awaken. Okay, 100% rebound in the control. But the experimental group, the ones who got this new four-part combo. Get this, an incredible 69% of those mice showed no viral rebound at all over the entire eight weeks. Almost 70%. The virus just didn't come back. 69%. That's, wow. that's not incremental. That's a huge jump from 0% in the controls. Why is that number nearly 70% such a powerful sign? Well, because it strongly suggests they didn't just temporarily suppress the virus deeper. It implies they actually eliminated the source, those infectious reservoir cells themselves. And they went further to confirm this. They did really sensitive tests on the tissues of the mice that didn't rebound. They looked in the key hiding spots, like the spleen, the brain. And what did they find there? In those critical tissues, no detectable intact HIV, zero virus capable of actually replicating and causing infection. What they did find were just fragments of defective HIV. Okay, let's clarify that difference for everyone listening. Intact versus defective HIV. Yeah, think of defective HIV like um, maybe finding broken bricks or bits of wiring after a building's been demolished. It's leftover genetic junk. It's recognizable as HIV material, but it's broken. It can't actually build a new functional virus particle. The intact HIV, on the other hand, is the complete blueprint, yeah. the fully functional virus ready to replicate and spread. So finding only defective bits, that's strong evidence the strategy successfully wiped out the actual source of infectious virus. Right. Okay, that makes sense. And this elimination, targeting only the intact, dangerous stuff, brings us to a really key strategic advantage of this approach, doesn't it? What's fascinating here is yeah. yeah, how incredibly selective this strategy seems to be, almost by accident. 
See, when we talk about HIV integrated into our DNA, scientists estimate only maybe 3% of it is actually replication competent, intact, yeah. able to cause disease. The other 97% is mostly defective junk, harmless genetic fossils, basically. Wow, only 3% is actually dangerous. Why does that matter so much for a cure strategy? Because think about those older shock and kill ideas. If you tried to design something to destroy every single cell with any HIV material in it, well, you'd be trying to kill cells containing 97% harmless junk. That would mean causing absolutely massive, widespread cell death throughout the body. Think of the inflammation, the damage. It would likely be incredibly toxic, maybe even fatal. Oh, uh, okay. But this new approach... By targeting the cell's survival mechanisms that only the active virus really stresses, it naturally ends up targeting only those cells where the virus is actually functional enough to cause that stress when it wakes up. That seems to be what's happening. It creates this beautiful targeted trap. It only kills the cells containing the dangerous 3%. So it's like a self-filtering system. Exactly. It's an elegant, sort of self-destructive catch-22 for the infectious virus. If the virus stays totally dormant, okay, maybe it persists as junk. But if it tries to wake up, even a little. The cell's defenses are gone, it senses the damage, and boom, it executes itself. Yeah. The infectious virus can't win. It's targeted efficiency built right into the mechanism. That is incredibly elegant. But, and there's always a but in science, isn't there? This is still humanized mice, cells wow. in dishes. It's not people yet. We absolutely have to inject some caution here. Uh -huh. What are the biggest hurdles, the biggest worries moving this towards actual human clinical trials? Yeah, this is maybe the most critical point. While that 69% no rebound figure is frankly spectacular for this stage, we have to stress this is still an early stage preclinical study. Human trials are a whole different ballgame, especially when you're messing with fundamental cellular processes like apoptosis. Right. Apoptosis, that programmed cell death, isn't just for fighting infection. Our bodies use it constantly for normal stuff, right? Like getting rid of old cells, shaping tissues during development, controlling the immune system. So what happens if this therapy, designed to make apoptosis easier, isn't perfectly targeted? That's the absolute core concern. You cannot risk making healthy, normal cells suddenly prone to self-destructing just because they happen to be using those same anti-death or autophagy pathways for routine maintenance. If this drug combination caused even a small amount of unintended apoptosis in healthy tissues, the side effects could be really severe. Widespread tissue damage, toxicity, inflammation, it's a serious risk. So the big challenge now is all about formulation, delivery, precision. Can they find ways to ensure these molecules only get into or only get activated within those specific HIV reservoir cells? It's a brilliant proof of concept. It shows what could be possible. But the road from here to a safe, marketable cure, it's still long, and it's paved with these really tough precision challenges. Okay. So what does this all mean then for someone listening right now? Where does this leave us? We've clearly moved beyond just hoping to manage HIV with pills forever. It means we're inching closer, maybe even taking a significant step closer to that dream of a functional cure. And remember, that's the goal. Letting people safely stop daily therapy without the virus ever coming back. What this study really proves is that by digging deep, by truly understanding the intricate ways the virus manipulates our cells, we can actually flip that manipulation. We can turn the virus's best defense into its fatal weakness. The vision is just, it's incredibly hopeful, isn't it? A short course of treatment, maybe, that could actually erase the active infectious reservoir, freeing people from that lifelong burden of daily meds and the constant low-level anxiety of rebound. That's the ultimate goal. A future where HIV is not a life sentence of medication. And thinking bigger, the core defense here was HIV forcing the host cell to live, blocking that self-destruct. It makes you wonder, doesn't it, how many other chronic diseases, maybe other persistent viruses, maybe even some cancers, are relying on similar stay alive no matter what's tricks inside our cells. If we can find those tricks and learn how to block them, could we unlock similar kinds of self-destructive cures for other conditions too? That's the really provocative thought this kind of research leaves us with, isn't it? Something to mull over for the future of medicine.